can you beat my GM on all the hardest difficulty settings whilst only using Legend Superstars in WWE 2K23? I wanted to find out. I had no idea how many issues I would run into in this challenge, and trust me, there are a lot of problems when only using Legends, but we'll get to those a little bit later on. To fit in with the theme of this challenge, I decided to use the legendary GM himself, Teddy Long, whose power card allows us to sign one legend completely free of charge in the week that we use it. Teddy will be managing WCW and trying to lead us glory versus Sonya Deville at SmackDown, Xavier Woods at Raw, and Kurt Angle at NXT. I sped through the draft, selecting the cheapest superstars on offer to give myself as much money as I possibly could to form my legend roster. Oh yeah, I forgot to say, we do things in a much more difficult way than many others would in a Legends Only Challenge. No custom rosters, we're doing this the hard way. The real way. Welcome to Legends Only. I start by releasing my male champion, Noam Dar, as I needed to free up the world title for the Legends to compete for. This also gives me a little bit more cash to play with, as I use my Legends Whisperer power card and go shopping. I chose to make my free signing Hulk Hogan, as not only does he have decent stamina and great popularity, but he would also be signing on a 10 week contract, and that was important. As I looked through the options and made my other signings, I tried to exclusively sign 10 weekers, as it would make my life a lot more simple so I wasn't negotiating contracts every 5 weeks. And money really wasn't an issue at this point, seeing as I had about 1.8 million in the bank. The key words there being, at this point. Going into the show, I felt confident that these first five weeks would fly by as I put on a great card and managed to set up some key rivalries ready for our first PLE. I crowned three new champions in The Undertaker, Scott Hall, and then Hurricane and Bruno Sammartino who picked up the tag belts. We took an early lead and things were going well. Week 2 saw us release our women's champion Roxanne Perez and sign every female legend we could so that we could put on some matches for two more titles. First though, we had to change Trish and Beth Phoenix into heels, so the women's tag match would have to wait another week before it got started. The show itself was another well put together, star studded affair as you'd expect, but annoyingly I didn't hit the drama curve properly as my main event was slightly worse than the second mid card. This didn't end up mattering though as we still gained the most fans by 10,000 and extended our lead at the top. We then cruised through weeks 3 and 4 doing much of the same. As predicted, the first part of this challenge was going pretty smoothly as we have a roster of extremely popular wrestlers who have a guaranteed 5 star power no matter what. The only thing we had to worry about was stamina and by the end of week 4 that was starting to become a bit of an issue. I didn't want to build a huge roster of legends that I could rotate with because then I wouldn't be getting the value for money out of each superstar. Seeing as they're all on short term contracts, I chose to utilise them to the max and squeeze every last match out of them as I knew that wasting a load of cash this early on would come back to haunt me later on. Little did I know at this point how crucial this decision was for the challenge. As we closed out week 4 we had a fairly big lead over the other brands and life was good. Until we opened our emails. Waiting for us were four members of our roster that all needed their contracts renewing, and it wasn't cheap. This is why our Legends Only Challenge is far more difficult than what other people do. You see, at the start of the run, I could have customised the roster and changed the Legends to active superstars, meaning that they could be signed permanently in the initial draft. Instead, we've left them to only be signed on temporary contracts, which makes budgeting in this challenge ridiculously difficult. Every 5 or 10 weeks, we'll have to renew their contract and that will add up, but that's also why we chose WCW as our brand. Their classically trained power card will immediately extend all our Legends contracts by 5 weeks, which would save us a huge amount of money, so I had to consider when it would be best to use that as well. Fortunately, because I planned ahead and made sure to sign Legends with 10 week contracts, there weren't that many to get through and I had a decent amount of money to deal with it. But this was a small taste of things to come and I had no idea just how bad it would get. Backlash came along and after that small bump in the road, we were back on track to take this challenge by storm. We had multiple rivalries coming to a head and almost every title was on the line. I also added in some big stipulations to make sure we smashed the ratings and took as big of a lead as possible over the other brands. But this would actually end up costing me further down the line and you'll see what I'm talking about in a moment. Hurricane and San Martino continued their reign of terror over the tag division with an impressive 4.5 star opener, while Brie Bella became the new women's champion at the first time of asking. But this got me thinking, what if I made this run even more challenging for myself and tried to take a mid card legend in the Hurricane and finish the run with him as my world champion? And so the challenge was set, I was going to make Gregory Helms even more of a legend than he already is. 
The women's tag match also delivered a big result in the middle of the card, with Bree's sister Nikki picking up gold herself alongside Molly Holly. Then RVD closed out his rivalry with Doink the Clown in a four-star match, meaning that we needed to end with a bang in order to achieve the perfect drama curve. Hogan vs Hall Two men with an extensive history faced off in the main event. And it was an Iron Man match, due to one of my Hall of Fame trophy goals being to put on five of them. After roughly five minutes of aggressive finger pointing and flexing, Hogan finally hangs Hall up on the ropes and somehow scores a pinfall off of the back of it. Although, on reflection, that's a very Hulk Hogan way to pin someone. After three and a half more minutes, we saw another pinfall from the deadliest leg drop in wrestling history, and the floodgates opened. Immediately after the three count, Hulk went full Hogan and started to G up the crowd, only to get hit with the razor's edge which gave Scott Hall his first point of the match. Hogan then went on to win 5-1, but I thought it was too funny not to include. The match received our first 5 star rating, but it came with a catch. Scott Hall suffered a 5 week injury, which really messed up our plans, as that was the length of the rest of his contract. Remember when I said that putting on big stipulations would cost me? Well, this is the result. The show got an amazing booking rating, and we increased our lead by a fair amount, but now I had a stamina epidemic on my hands, and one of my main guys was out for the rest of his contract. Big changes needed to be made that could seriously affect our chances of winning this challenge. Luckily for me though, The Undertaker and Umaga still had a rivalry going on that I could put as the opener, and then Lita and Brie were still feuding, so that was my main event. Other than that, our roster was extremely limited due to stamina, so I ended up buying Booker T to tie things over in a feud with Doink the Clown. I tried my best to keep the Hurricane's stamina somewhat high, as I really didn't want him to get an injury, meaning that he'd be sitting out a few of the shows, but because my stamina levels were so low, there's no way I could keep him benched for that long. The problem I started to see developing in front of my eyes was that due to me having a small roster to save money, I didn't really have any stamina saving rivalries to throw in when my stars needed a rest. This meant that Week 6's show was simply dreadful. Four normal singles matches because I really couldn't do much else. But this is where them being legends really came in clutch. Because of their star power and popularity, I managed to get an amazing booking rating and comfortably gained the most fans out of all the brands. I knew this wasn't going to last forever though, as my stamina problems were far from solved. At this point, anyone with 40 stamina or over was seen as good to go, as at least they weren't in threat of being injured from the match, but all that meant was that we were delaying the inevitable rather than preventing it. In week 7, we got a request from Hogan saying him and Booker would make a good tag team. And I don't know about you, but I wasn't about to put Booker through that brother. The week itself was also a disaster. Four more normal matches with no real goal in sight, only to get through these few weeks in time for the PLE, but that also posed a problem. You see, over the next couple of weeks, I watched helplessly as my stamina decreased more and more. Even if I was only putting on normal matches, they took their toll. Not only that, but come the next PLE, I was going to have to put them into big stipulations, meaning the majority of them were likely to pick up injuries. I was faced with a decision to make. Do I use my classically trained power card before the PLE to extend everyone's contract by 5 weeks? Sure it would save me a ton of money, but the stars would be near enough useless or injured. I chose to ignore the problem for now and somehow get through to week 10. If I had enough feuds to put into a show, it wouldn't matter how low their stamina was as they'd be able to perform. After week 9 though, we were hit with another wall of contract renewals. Almost my entire roster was needing one, and I wasn't about to waste hundreds of thousands of dollars on them, even if I did have the cash. So I tucked my classically trained power card away in my back pocket and had a clear out, telling every single one of them that I was letting their contract run out and that this would be their last week. Even the hurricane was shown the exit, and this was calculated as I knew I'd be able to sign him back later on in the run with hopefully an increase in stamina and for less than 129k, which seemed very steep. My thinking for the mass exodus was that after week 10, they'd all leave, and with my large sum of money, I could just replace them all with an entirely new roster. It made the most sense to do this in my head, but was it going to pay off? Or was I giving up some hugely popular superstars at a crucial time? SummerSlam was upon us, and we were off to an okay start, with a 4-star opener and a 3.5-star first midcard match. And as predicted, the injuries were rolling in, but due to my new plan, that wasn't really a concern. The Undertaker and Umaga finally got to end their rivalry for the Hardcore Championship in yet another Iron Man match. I had three of these on the card as I needed to get them in somewhere, and seeing as I didn't care about stamina after this show, it seemed like a great time to do that. The Undertaker made light work of the match, and finished his time with WCW as a champion. His parting gift for us was a 4.5 star match as well, so things were picking up a bit. 
The women's tag match then got a 4.5 star as well, with the main event getting us a lovely 5 star rating to end the show. Those results meant that we absolutely obliterated the competition and extended our lead at the top to a very comfortable distance. So with SummerSlam out the way, it was time for a rebuild. WCW had provided an extremely solid 10 weeks of entertainment, but their stars were completely spent. Triple H tried to give us enhancement talent to help us out, but with our small fortune of a budget, I knew that signing a new roster wouldn't be too bad. I was ready to launch a new brand, one with a really inventive and unique name and identity. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a new era, WCW 2.0. Also, what on earth is this disrespect? Trixie Gambit should be in this Legends run, not being used as enhancement talent. You better check yourself, Paul. And with that, I had a lot to do and not much time to do it. Well, that's a lie. Theoretically, I had as long as I wanted, but that's not as good for the story. One thing that made this all a bit more scary was that I was relying solely on randomness at this point. I needed stars with good class type synergy to appear in the Legends pool, otherwise I could kiss this challenge goodbye. Thankfully, in the men's division, there were some great options waiting for us. None more so than the man, the myth, the true legend himself, Hurricane. And for an absolute fraction of the price that his contract extension would have cost. Meaning that my plan had worked out to a T. We also signed Bret Hart to feud with Razor Ramon, Andre the Giant to pair up with the Hurricane, and a few others to fill out the cards every week. We weren't so lucky when it came to the women's division, however. I quickly realised that I basically signed all of the female legends in my first 10 weeks, so they were all either leaving or had already left and had awful stamina. Either way, we were able to put on a half decent show in week 11, making sure to lay the groundwork for lots of rivalries to be resolved in week 15, and continue to be the best performing brand of the four. WCW 2.0 was off to an okay start, but if you thought our issues at the end of the original WCW were bad, just you wait until you see what's to come. Over the next few weeks, I continued to build up the new rivalries we started in week 11, and began the Hurricanes push to the upper midcard. I didn't want to put him in the world title picture straight away, so fighting Andre for the Hardcore Championship was a good step up at this stage. But sadly, in week 12 and 14, he failed to capture it from the Giant on both occasions, setting himself up for one last attempt at Extreme Rules. Unfortunately, I couldn't put on a single women's match in this time, meaning that I was not only missing out on the title matches and variety that would boost my ratings, but also on additional matches to help preserve stamina, and this started to cause me issues very quickly. By the time week 14 rolled around, I was having to put on full shows of normal singles matches again, with a lot of my stars having low 40s for stamina. Not only that, but I was also faced with multiple contract renewals that needed sorting. But after replacing my entire roster just a few weeks ago, I had nowhere near enough money to do this. So I resorted to using my classically trained power card to give them all five more weeks. This might seem like a stupid idea given they're all struggling with stamina, but this would be the same regardless of when I used it. And before I could at least afford to replace my stars, now I had no choice. The shows themselves were fine, but I now had extreme rules to deal with, and I couldn't just put on singles matches in a PLE. So I had to sacrifice whatever little stamina I had left and bite the bullet, knowing that multiple people on my roster were about to suffer injuries that would haunt us for the rest of the run. We couldn't even book any promo slots in week 15 due to our stamina issues, but I was hoping that wouldn't matter. If I could just get through this show with the least amount of injuries possible, I'd be happy. We kicked things off with our men's tag rivalry, which saw Mr. McMahon team up with Bad Bunny to take down Batista and Rikishi and become the new tag champs. The only problem was that Bad Bunny picked up a two-week injury in our first match. Not a good sign of things to come. Next up, our first mid-card match, and incredibly, Kevin Nash managed to avoid doing his favourite part-time activity, which is tearing both quads, and we got through the fight unscathed. But the middle mid-card match between Andre the Giant and the Hurricane was the one that all the fans came to see. An Extreme Rules match, and I knew this one was a concern. Both of them had below 40 stamina going into it, so all I could hope for was a good match rating and for the potential injuries to not be too bad. But that wasn't the main concern. Was the Hurricane going to win singles gold at the third time of asking against an opponent almost twice his size? Well, they put on a classic, with Andre giving Helms an absolute beatdown for a large segment of it, but we have a star on our hands. The Hurricane had been given one more shot in the WWE, and he was hardly going to let it slip away. Through pure grit and determination, he fought on, taking the hits and laughing back in the Giant's face. Eventually, he lost it, sick of being mocked by Andre and the fans thinking that he had no chance. Out of nowhere, in a feat of what can only be described as Herculean strength, 
He hauled Andre up onto his back and hit a devastating vertebraker. The sheer amount of weight landing on the mat meant that Andre had no chance, and with that, Hurricane defies all the odds to win the Hardcore Championship in a 5-star match. This wasn't the end of his story either, he wanted more, looking immediately at the world title as his next target. The final midcard match saw Vader and Stone Cold put on a 4-star match, with both competitors picking up a 2-week injury, and then the main event got a 4.5-star rating as we managed to avoid any injuries in that one. Not that it mattered, because overall, we'd suffered a total of 4 injuries throughout the entire show, which would completely ruin our roster. Not only that, but the stars that survived this bloodbath wouldn't be able to perform for weeks anyway. It all looked to be an absolute disaster, and although we did gain the most fans by a fair few again, the last 10 weeks were going to be extremely difficult to book around. As predicted, the weeks leading up to the 4th PLE started terribly, with Xavier Woods playing a masterful good talent power card on us. This would increase the price of any new legends we bought by $20,000, and this wouldn't usually be an issue, but we actually have to buy people this week in order to be able to put on shows. So, it really was looking pretty bleak. On top of that, I had around $400,000 left to spend after the launch of WCW 2.0, so I had to be extremely careful when booking the next few shows. I brought in Goldberg and Six in week 16 out of sheer necessity and proceeded to put on possibly the worst show you'll ever see. And it wasn't just the match variety that suffered, we also picked up three more long-term injuries to Vince McMahon, Rikishi and Bret Hart. We were crumbling, and with nine long and brutal weeks lying ahead of us, we were really starting to panic. We have next to no money and half our roster is injured. I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I buckled myself in and got to booking week 17 through 19. And wouldn't you know it, in steps a hero. Or at least a wrestler dressed as a superhero. As in week 17, the Hurricane got his shot at the world title. I couldn't believe it when I saw it, but the Hurricane actually came out with the win, becoming both the hardcore and world title holder only 7 weeks after being released by the company. Not to mention he'd already dominated the tag division in WCW as well, the man has really won it all. What was perhaps even more incredible though was the fact that neither him nor Nash picked up an injury, and put on a 4 star match, talk about a true superhero. However, over these few weeks, due to the horrific circumstances we found ourselves in, I had to spend whatever little money I had left on getting new legends through the door. That meant signing ridiculously expensive talents such as The Rock and a returning Hulk Hogan initially, then adding one or two more legends every week once we got some more money. We also had to bench key title holders in order to let them regain stamina, so it was less than an optimal strategy, as it meant that we couldn't really get any rivalries going, but it was necessary, and allowed us to scrape together three more painstakingly boring shows before Hell in a Cell in week 20. Just before that though, we had another issue, one that had already plagued us in week 9 and forced us to make a huge decision. Contract renewals. There was no way I could physically renew all of them, as my budget had been taking hit after hit for weeks now. I had to simply say goodbye to the majority of my roster and hope that I could replace them with short term deals for the remaining weeks. It was going to be messy, but I could see the finish line now, and our lead was still very much intact. I'm not going to sugarcoat this, Hell in a Cell was a pathetic mess. Five normal singles matches with only one title on the line, but at least it was the world title. Once again, I was relying on their legendary status to pull through, but surely it wasn't that powerful. The slightly good news is that every match bar the main event was safe from injuries, as the competitors all had above 40 stamina. Now, this didn't mean that this wouldn't hugely affect us for the next five weeks anyway, but at least they were still available for selection. Yep, that's where we're at at this point. To my surprise, the matches were actually going okay ratings wise, and the show wasn't as horrific as I thought, and in his first ever world title defence, the Hurricane won yet again, taking out Kevin Nash, and amazingly, no one was injured. Not only was he looking on track to finish the run as world champion, but he was also pulling bangers out of the bag every time he showed up. It'd be safe to say that he's rewritten his legacy already at this point, but I wanted to complete the challenge I set myself. Hurricane needed to end the run as the world champion. The results came in and we got an amazing booking whilst gaining just 124,000 fans. We were the second worst performers this week, but not by a catastrophic amount. I had 5 more weeks to go and absolutely no plan whatsoever. However, making it through the last 5 weeks had given me some hope. All we needed to do was not lose tens of thousand fans every week and we'd be fine. If we could drag a roster of beaten and bruised bodies to WrestleMania, then we could get as many injuries as we like, as it quite literally wouldn't matter. 
With this newfound confidence, I progressed into week 21. Oh, for fuck's sake. Look at all of those expiring contracts. It's okay. With only five weeks left, they weren't asking for that much, and I was willing to sacrifice morale in order to barter for a cheaper deal. I went through them all and offered them an extension at a cutthroat price. Some left the company angry and bitter, some stayed angry and bitter, and some of them I had to suck it up and pay them what they were worth. But somehow, some way, we got through it with a little bit of cash left over. We spent that cash on the heartbreak kid Shawn Michaels, who had an incredible amount of stamina at this stage of the run. We put him straight into the main event of yet another show that would probably cause riots if you charged people money to go and see it, and watched on as we gained a good booking despite the main event only getting a two and a half star rating. We gained half the amount of fans that Raw and NXT did, and that was concerning. If the shows continued to go like that, I could see us slipping down the leaderboard sooner or later. Like I said, I just needed to put on somewhat passable shows and make it to WrestleMania. If I could go into week 25 with enough stamina and some decent rivalries, I'd have a good chance of coming out of this challenge with a win. Incredibly, the next few weeks actually saw an upward turn in results, but we faced an immediate setback in week 22, as Andre the Giant came back with a vengeance and won the world title off of Hurricane. I had a huge decision to make. Hurricane's stamina was at an all-time low, and we had Shawn Michaels waiting in the wings with tons of it, and a good amount of popularity too. So, it's with an extremely heavy heart that I tell you, this was the end of the Hurricane's run in WCW 2.0. He'd risen like a salmon to the top of the card, winning the hardcore title and the world title in the space of a few weeks. But after losing to Andre here, he was in no physical condition to fight anytime soon. Unfortunately, he had to retire again, but will go down as the GOAT of this run, and the most deserving recipient of legendary status ever to live. There were more problems facing us though, as I had to keep buying new legends to plug the gaps in my roster, which meant that our budget stayed pretty low. Would I even be able to afford to put on a spectacle at WrestleMania? Well, after week 24, I was able to breathe a huge sigh of relief. We had over $300,000 in the bank, and enough superstars to put on a show. Our lead had stayed roughly the same as it was in week 21, so all that was left to do was put on a good show at WrestleMania, and the challenge was ours. With a roster that looked like it had just gone to war and back, we stumbled into WrestleMania. I put on matches with the biggest stipulations possible, as stamina was of no concern to me anymore. HBK and Andre opened the show with a 5-star Hell in a Cell match for the title, which was a great start. Goldberg then took out Razor Ramon to end their rivalry in a 4-star match, and we were well in line with the drama curve at this point. The second mid-card match had OG Kane going up against Six to put an end to their level 4 rivalry. It was a TLC match, which slightly favoured Six, as Kane isn't known for scaling ladders. But that didn't stop the Big Red Machine, as he planted him with a chokeslam and unhooked the briefcase. That one got us a 4.5 star rating, and so did the final mid-card match where Ted DiBiase planted Bret Hart through a table. At this point, I was fairly certain we'd won the run, the results had been good so far, and our lead was almost insurmountable but there was still one match to go. Rikishi and Batista had one final shot at reclaiming the Tag Team Championships. This was an Extreme Rules match, level 4 rivalry that needed resolving. And my word, did they do just that. After a gruelling fight with all four participants barely able to walk, Batista and Rikishi, or Bakishi as I like to call them, managed to win their titles back in a truly feel-good WrestleMania moment. We ended the show with another 4.5 star rated match, and just like that, despite all the controversy surrounding allegations of me mistreating my employees, Teddy Long ended the run in the number 1 position. It is a real shame that I couldn't end the run with the Hurricane as world champion, but he did more than enough to solidify his legacy anyway, and still finish things off as the hardcore champion, so even if he isn't a world title holder, he's at least the king of the mid-carders. If you enjoyed this video, then you need to check out our other MyGM Challenge videos. I've put one on screen for you to click through to now.